hell. It wasn't that bad. Friends don't lie. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 things you missed in Stranger Things Season 4, Parts 1 and 2. Always the goddamn babysitter. For this list, we're looking at Easter eggs, references, and callbacks in this fourth installment of the Netflix series. Warning, if you haven't finished Season 4 Parts 1 and 2, there are major spoilers ahead. Did you catch any of these? Let us know down below. Number 20. Spielberg Inspiration It's no secret that the Duffer Brothers have been inspired by several Steven Spielberg works. With the Indiana Jones-like character of Jim Hopper and the raptor-sounding shrieks of various demo creatures. And of course, communicating through lights and the various portals are nods to Poltergeist. Most notably, the show's first season is inspired by E.T. the Extraterrestrial. In season four, they take the E.T. vibe further in California. The lovable alien also gets a shout out while Dustin is on the phone with Steve. In chapter six, Steve has a Jaws moment when he's pulled underwater like the film's first victim, who is also named Chrissy. It's pretty damn big. Will has had a Jaws poster on his wall in both Hawkins and California. Number 19, Lady Applejack. Since season two, Erica Sinclair has been stealing scenes left and right. In season four, Mike and Dustin enlist her help to take Lucas's place during an epic Dungeons and Dragons campaign. When Will left for California in the season three finale, Erica inherited his D&D books, so she's had some time to master the game. She's dismissed by the Hellfire Club's master Eddie, but she quickly proves she knows her stuff. My name is Lady Applejack, and I'm a chaotic, good, half-elf rogue level 14, and I will sneak behind any monster you throw my way and stab them in the back with my poison so cool creep. Erica goes by Lady Applejack, a character from My Little Pony, a callback to Dustin outing her as a nerd in season three. Centaurs and castles and dragons and magic are all standard nerd tropes. Ergo, My Little Pony is nerdy. Ergo, you, Erica, are a nerd. She shows up to the campaign like a boss in her American flag cape, because remember, you can't spell America without Erica. Number 18, Lucas Reads the Talisman. In the season four finale, Lucas sits at Max's bedside reading 1984's The Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub. King's influence is all over the series, but this specific reference is interesting for a couple of reasons. He opened his eyes and further words died in his throat. He forgot about the need to sick up that horrible parody of wine. The story, partially set in Max's home state of California, follows 12-year-old Jack Sawyer's quest to save his dying mother, and includes parallel universes called the Territories and an earthquake. The specific section Lucas reads to a comatose Max is about a character opening their eyes. In 2021, it was announced that the Duffer Brothers are also in the process of adapting the talisman with Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I think yeah. with Spielberg, it really what is so inspiring is just how much he loves the joy of storytelling, and specifically with this, the story of the talisman. Number 17, Elle's new look. When we left off last season, Eleven was headed to California with the Byers family for a fresh start. The teen's personal style is still evolving, and in her new home of Lenora Hills, she clearly takes inspiration from her pseudo-mom, Joyce. You are right, it just takes time. All right, hold on to your butts, bro chachos. The brown hair with bangs and the effortlessly cool tee and flannel combo with jeans looks are nearly identical. Some exciting news. Joyce got an amazing new job. She gets to work at home. Elle does experiment with some uber 80s trends, but she seems most comfortable in her Joyce-esque attire. No matter what her outfit is, she still wears the blue bracelet from Hopper. And she's not the only one rocking a new look. Mike's longer locks are clearly inspired by Eddie, and Lucas actor Caleb McLaughlin suggested number eight as his jersey number in honor of the late Kobe Bryant. Number 16, Demogorgon Lab. When Hopper, Joyce, Murray, Antonov, and Yuri are escaping the Russian prison, they find that the Russians have been experimenting on Demogorgons. Joyce and Hopper have seen a lot of weird stuff since they were thrown into this world of monsters and alternate dimensions. But when they come across a lab full of glass tubes holding Demogorgons, they are still in awe and disbelief. What the hell are they doing? 
The scene reminds us of Alien Resurrection, which starred Joyce Byers herself, Winona Ryder. While the movie is from 1997, the Duffers have been inspired by the Alien franchise before, like casting Paul Reiser, known for his role in Aliens, as Dr. Sam Owens back in Season 2. It's polycarbonate. I can't, can't get through. Number 15. Max and Eleven at the Snowball Elle's encounter and revenge against her high school tormentors is an obvious homage to Carrie. But Max has her own Carrie moment in Chapter 9, where she's later joined by the telekinetic heroine. If you touch her again, I will kill you again. When Max thinks back to one of her happiest memories, she finds herself at the Hawkins Middle School Snowball of 1984, where she and Lucas shared their first dance and kiss. But as we saw at the end of Season 2, the Mind Flayer is seen looming over the school, meaning Vecna knows all about this memory. His arrival to the emptied dance brings an overall carry at the prom aesthetic, complete with blue and red lighting. Before I kill you, I want you to watch. There's also blood, though the popping balloons are more evocative of Stephen King's It. Number 14, The Cunninghams. Another new addition to the show was Chrissy Cunningham, a popular cheerleader who is unfortunately a victim of Vecna. It's implied that she's been haunted by the otherworldly creature for some time, while struggling with her body image spurred on by her mother. Chrissy? Did you hear me? Open the goddamn door, Chrissy! Open the door, Chrissy, or I'm gonna cut you like the fat pig that you are! In her confrontation with Vecna, he creates twisted versions of her parents that echo the look of the Deadites in the Evil Dead franchise. Her mother's voice becomes demonic, and she turns around to reveal a devilish grin and white, glazed eyes, reminiscent of the trademark trickery of the Deadites taking over loved ones. Huh? Just loosening this up for you, sweetheart. You're going to look absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Jonathan has had an Evil Dead poster on his wall for a while now, but this might be our first taste of true evil in Hawkins. <laughs> Number 13, Billy Hargrove's Headstone. At the beginning of the season, we find Max still feeling the sadness and guilt over her stepbrother's death. When she thinks she's Vecna's next victim, she writes letters to her friends, parents, and Billy. If you can even hear this, they really hope that you can. Max goes to read the letter at his grave, which we caught a glimpse of in the trailer. But there's a weird difference between shots. Basically, ever since you left, Everything's been a total disaster. The trailer shows the headstone marked Billy Hargrove. In the series, it's been changed to read William Hargrove. We're not sure why this would have been changed, but it is an interesting discrepancy nonetheless. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry, Billy. Number 12, Penhurst Mental Hospital. An undercover Nancy and Robin go to Penhurst to question the infamous Victor Creel about his horrifying experience decades before. We're here because we believe you. And because we need your help. The hospital is inspired by movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Shutter Island. And when they're led to Creel's cell, the scene is reminiscent of Clarice Starling's first meeting with Dr. Hannibal Lecter in The Silence of the Lambs. But this isn't the first mention of the hospital on the show. Back in season one, after stumbling upon the mysterious Eleven, the boys speculate where the weirdo in the woods came from. Lucas offers up Penhurst as a possible location. I bet she escaped from Penhurst. From where? The Nuthouse in Curly County. Penhurst is also the name of a reportedly real haunted hospital in Pennsylvania. Number 11, Family Video. All of Family Video's posters, VHS covers, and 80s memorabilia could make up a list of their own. Fast Times at Ridgemont High is mentioned a few times in the series, including Dustin's description of Susie and an in-store cutout of Phoebe Cates seen in Season 3. Oh! Fast Times. Fast Times. Ever heard of it? In Season 4, 
Steve encourages Robin to give it a shot with her crush Vicky based on her rental history. Vicky is definitely not the wrong girl. We just don't know that, do we? She returned fast times, paused at 53 minutes, five seconds. Do you know who pauses fast times at 53 minutes, five seconds? But the smallest of Easter eggs appears when they look up all the Ricks in the system, and at the bottom, you'll see Rick Sanchez. Rick and Morty also had their own Stranger Things reference in an Adult Swim promo back in 2019. Plus, both shows have Freddy Krueger-inspired villains, one of which is featured in store. Number 10. A Nightmarish Season The long-awaited fourth season of the Netflix hit went from a fun sci-fi adventure to a straight-up horror show, and we love it. We got major A Nightmare on Elm Street vibes from the trailers, but new antagonist Vecna is more Freddy Krueger than Mind Flayer. I see you've been looking for me, Nancy. You were so close, so close to the truth. The Duffers discussed their love of classic 80s horror villains, so it's no surprise that the season feels like an homage to the Dream Demon. The glowing red and fogginess in Vecna's mind layer even resembles Freddy's boiler room as noted by Dustin. Maybe you infiltrated his mind. He invaded your mind, right? Is it that big of a leap to suggest you somehow wound up in his? Like Freddy Krueger's boiler room. Freddy Krueger? And instead of a shrieking Demogorgon, we hear Vecna verbally taunting his teenage victims in their nightmare hallucinations. You belong here with me. Really here. Robert Englund, the legendary actor of the razor-fingered villain, even appears in the series as Victor Creel, the father of this Freddy-inspired baddie. Number 9. Eddie Munson One of the newest and coolest characters on Stranger Things this season is Hellfire Club leader Eddie Munson. He's a metalhead who resembles a young Eddie Van Halen, Ozzy Osbourne, and other rockers of the time. But we wonder if it's a coincidence that his name sounds an awful lot like Eddie Munster. When he first appears on screen, we hear I was a teenage werewolf by the cramps. Dungeons and Dragons. At first regarded as a harmless game of make-believe, now has both parents and psychologists concerned. We're not saying he is a werewolf, but his style and hobby surely made the people of Hawkins uncomfortable. Fittingly, Eddie is also the name of Iron Maiden's mascot. Number 8. Satanic Panic After the death of Chrissy Cunningham, the town instantly blames Eddie the Freak Munson, partly because it happened in his trailer, but also because he's an outcast who listens to metal and plays Dungeons and Dragons. I've read the wrong person plays this game. It can, it can warp their mind. They confuse fantasy and reality, and innocent people die. I mean, it's been happening all over the country. It's like, it's like an epidemic. An unhinged Jason Carver, Chrissy's preppy boyfriend, and teammates go on a manhunt, getting the other Hawkins residents riled up in the process. The Duffers were inspired by the West Memphis Three case, in which three outcasts were wrongfully convicted of a triple murder in their small town. Eddie was modeled after one of the teens, Damian Eccles. At the end of the season, the kind-hearted Hellion is still blamed for everything, including the so-called earthquake and the tragic deaths the news called the Munson murders. Sound familiar? A growing chorus believes the two recent tragedies are linked claiming the Munson murders opened a doorway between worlds. A doorway, they say, into hell itself. Number 7. The Hellfire Club Other than being a rad name, the Hellfire Club holds some historical significance. In the 18th century, this was a common name for exclusive clubs attended by the wealthy elite, like gentlemen's clubs or high society figures wishing to keep their activities secret. It means you boys, the future, Mike and Dustin's new D&D crew of outcasts is more likely inspired by the mutant group in the X-Men comics. We already know Dustin's a big X-Men fan, calling back to Will wanting his X-Men number 134 in the very first episode of the series. Get back here! I'm gonna kill you! I'll take your X-Men 134! Number 6. Cerebro Speaking of X-Men, Dustin's creation dubbed Cerebro, after Charles Xavier's device used to amplify his psychic abilities, comes in handy again this season. We tap into the Hawkins PD dispatch with our Cerebro, and they're definitely looking for you. Vecna uses a very Cerebro-like method to find his next victim. He psychically searches for Hawkins' residents in distress, and like Charles, he hears overlapping voices of anxious and troubled individuals. When he finds Patrick McKinney, the high schooler gets a sharp pain in his head and a nosebleed, the telltale signs of Vecna's curse. 
Eleven's story has been likened to Jean Grey in the Dark Phoenix saga, so it's fitting that Henry slash one slash Vecna is somewhat of an evil Professor X. What if I'm not good? What if I'm the monster? I don't know you that well, kiddo, but I'm betting the fate of the planet that you're one of the good ones. Number 5. Han Solo Quotes Stranger Things loves a Star Wars reference, but did you catch one of Han Solo's iconic quotes? During the D&D game, Dustin says to his fellow Hellfire Club members, never tell me the odds. Chances of success are 20 to 1. Never tell me the odds. This line was said by the hero in 1980's The Empire Strikes Back. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. But it's Murray who uses one of Han's well-known lines that turned into a running gag. I don't know, Jim. I got a bad feeling about this. And in the third episode of season four, we catch a glimpse of Will and Jonathan watching Ewoks, ABC's animated series based on the furry creatures from the Star Wars universe. The show ran from 1985 to 1986, and since the season is set in spring 1986, it definitely would have been a favorite among the characters. Number four, music and dreams. With all the A Nightmare on Elm Street connections, dreams are obviously a big theme this season. When Robin and Nancy go to visit Victor Creel at the mental institution, he tells them the story of what happened to his family and mentions hearing Ella Fitzgerald's Dream a Little Dream of Me. Right at first I believed it was an angel. And I followed her, only to find myself in a nightmare far worse. But before that, the doctor takes them through the listening room, explaining how music can reach a special part of the brain. We found that music has a particularly calming effect on the broken mind. The right song, particularly one which holds some personal meaning, can prove a salient stimulus. On the chalkboard, we see dream-themed song titles like I'll See You In My Dreams and Wrap Your Troubles In Dreams. Moonlight Serenade is another song listed, but the original title in 1935 was, wait for it, Now I Lay Me Down to Weep. As for red sails in the sunset, we got nothing. Anything? Nothing. Number three, Will's birthday. Will has been through hell since the beginning, so when fans noticed the date of Mike's visit to California, they were worried that poor Will was getting 16 candled. We know his birthday is March 22nd because Joyce says it back in season two when she's trying to connect with him while he's under the influence of the Mind Flayer. Do you know what March 22nd is? It's your birthday. Your birthday. Well, it turns out the Duffers simply forgot about it and later apologized to fans and Will. We Let's wrote his this. birthday six years ago. I just right. don't, I don't remember and I don't sit down and rewatch my seasons. <laughs> like, right. I don't know last time I saw season two. Anyway, I'm glad. Thank you for the fans for catching us. Don't be mad at us <laughs> and uh, we're fixing it. Hey, mistakes happen. But if Will were to become a vengeful villain in season five, we totally understand. Number two, Vecna's origin story. Chapter 7 finally reveals how Vecna, aka Henry Creel, aka One, came to be. I could not close off my mind and join in the madness. I could not pretend. As he tells his story to Eleven, a familiar tune plays in the background. I could make my own rules. I could restore balance to a broken world. A predator. But for good. It might ring a bell for anyone who's seen 2009's Watchmen. The same instrumental tracks, Pruitt, Igo, and Prophecies were featured in scenes recounting the origin of Dr. Jonathan Osterman, a nuclear physicist who got stuck in a test chamber that literally tore him apart. I feel fear for the last time. He progressively reformed his body as a blue godlike being, later dubbed Dr. Manhattan. While their beginnings are certainly different, the haunting music, some of the imagery, and the 1950s setting had us thinking back to the stylistic comic book film. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Michael Myers References 
Way back in season two, Max went trick-or-treating with the boys wearing a Michael Myers costume. <laughs> which gets a callback in volume two when Eddie dons the mask. Hey, Red, uh, you got a ski mask or a bandana, something like that? Eddie's uncle also tells Nancy about the infamous Victor Creel, a man arrested for seemingly killing his family and sent to Penhurst Asylum. Like that, what's his name? The white mask and kill the babysitters. Michael Myers? Yeah, Michael Myers. He asked me, Victor's like that. With the recent murder of Chrissy Cunningham, Eddie's uncle thinks he could have broken out. He likens him to the killer from the Halloween franchise, which is ironic since Creel is played by another horror icon, Robert Englund. After the crew flambe Vecna and Nancy goes full-on Sarah Connor in what seemed like a victorious takedown, they see that his body is gone, much like the immortal Myers. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.